um, my book started as a um, as a family history in the most literal sense that my daughter Mary married the uh, distinguished Indian writer Pankaj Mishra and as a result of that I came to India and I suddenly realized that the whole Indian part, the Anglo-Indian part of my ancestry, which I hadn't really thought about, was one of the most fascinating um, episodes in the history of, of, of Britain and of India. And um, so I began to delve into it and, and wrote out of the f history of a family came a sort of history of the growth of British power in India and that extraordinary spreading over a hundred years of uh, British influence until it controlled the whole of India and what this meant for the people, uh, the very small number, the scattered strangers in the land, as one governor general called them, who ruled India and what of course it meant for the Indians themselves. And so I found myself led into a whole world of, um, of of networks um, and of great hardship borne by, uh, by the servants of the East India Company combined with considerable doubts as to whether they would what they were doing there in the first place and of course considerable violence and I was I was prepared for the brutality but I wasn't quite prepared for the self-doubt that so many of these imperialists showed because that's not how you normally think of them the choice of the title, The Tears of the Rajas, is uh, because time after time, when the British officer, who was very often, I have to say, I'm afraid, my great-great-grandfather, came to tell the Raja that the British government, or the East India Company, was taking over his, his dominions, or a large part of them, in the case of the Nizam of Hyderabad, um, that the Raja, seeing the end of all his world, would burst into tears and the British officer uh, would regard this as unmanly conduct because this was the heyday of the stiff upper lip um, in, in, in Britain and the British Empire and all display of emotion um, was regarded as um, a, a sign of weakness. And so it's this clash between two quite different cultures which I thought was symbolized by this, um, these terrible, uncomfortable meetings uh, between, between uh, the, 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 the British and, and, and the Rajas. And it, it happened time after time. Well, the thing is the British Raj was run by such a small number of people and they were uh, very largely uh, related to each other uh, and um, so that you can't do one without the other, so to, to speak, that as soon as you describe uh, the career moves that uh, uh, my great-great-grandfather had and his relations with Lord Dalhousie, you are describing the fate of the kingdom of Avad or, 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 or of, of, of earlier of Gwalior um, or of Jansi. Uh, and these, uh, these brutal negotiations, which in the end were a cumulative prov provocation which led to the Great Rebellion of 1857, that is, that is the history of, of British India, the, the principal thread of it. Um, and I think it is, it is best told um, through the lenses of the, of the people who were carrying out these orders. Uh, it falls into two very clear parts. In the first century of the British of the East India Company, its servants made a great deal of money, uh, they, and they came back to England and bought large country estates and were rather mocked as nouveau riches, as, as nabobs. Um, and then this was um, very largely cleared up. So the second half. Of, a British, of the second century of British rule is rather the opposite. The British um, officers and civil servants were constantly in debt. Uh, and um, when they came home, as they called it, for, 
to a country, England, which they'd scarcely ever seen, they found themselves with a very poor standard of living. The corruption, if you like, transferred from the individual level to, the, to, to that of the East India Company as a whole, which started extorting, and it had always extorted uh, huge loans and, and seized large tracts of, of, of Indian territory. But this became uh, almost um, uh, pathological in the later years of the East India Company, and as I say, um, was very much a key factor in, in the Great Rebellion. So, uh, private corruption to start with, state corruption later on. Um, I cover from when John Lowe, as a 16-year-old cadet, came out to Madras in 1805 and um, went to um, the cadet college just outside Madras, Tripasur, uh, until 1905 when he, um, his, the last of his sons left uh, India to go back to London to become keeper of the crown jewels in the Tower of London, in which capacity, um, ironically enough, he had custody of the koh i -Noor. Um, I had two main sources. One is uh, a tin box full of family papers, which I fi finally ran to earth in a cousin of mine had it on uh, teetering on top of a bookshelf. And that contained letters home and uh, state documents. But the bulk of the research is um, in the old India office library, a wonderful place on top of the British Library at St. Pancras, which is the finest collection of documents in the world. And because uh, uh, British India was such a huge bureaucracy, uh, a tendency which I'm afraid both India and Britain have inherited, um, every bit of paper was kept and everything had to go up to Calcutta if you you were putting in a request for a new saddle or to build a shed on the back of your bungalow. All these requests had to go through. So a whole detailed picture of their lives. And also, because they were so lonely, um, very often in isolated stations, they would confide all their fears and uh, worries and ill health to um, their superior, superior officers, which is strange to us. I mean, when you're writing a letter to your boss these days, you don't say, my wife is miserable uh, and I have terrible pain, pains in my legs. But they all did, so that it's all confiding um, their, their fears. But it should also be said that there is a huge amount of material in India, much of it still not uh, sorted through um, or translated, um, uh, and there's a rich mine for future scholars to look at. And, and I'm sure uh, we were talking earlier about how history changes. I'm sure that the future um, Indian scholars will change uh, the history of a lot of, of what I've been writing about. I think there is one central thing, which is both a personal and a national theme, is that John Lowe, the central figure, was famous all over India as a tremendous supporter of the rights of native rulers uh, and um, as against the pretensions of the East India Company. And yet in the course of his 50 years in India, he uh, removed three Rajas from office, each of them uh, uh, ruling over a sizable kingdom. And the fourth, the uh, Nizam uh, I've already referred to, he deprived of the most valuable half of his uh, kingdom, which uh, a grievance which persisted in Hyderabad right up until uh, independence. So there's this paradoxical thing of these well-intentioned civil servants being swept along in the sort of force of the imperialist impulse to do things which in their heart of hearts they did not think were right. Well, um, uh, that I've never enjoyed writing anything so much or being so fascinated or often so moved by uh, the, both by the, the heroism and the brutality and the, and the sheer tragedy of a lot of it.